the media and IPFW athletics. That's our topic for this edition of Mastodon Spotlight. We have with us guests such as Blake Sebring of the Fort Wayne News Sentinel, Mark Franke, who covers volleyball for College 56 Sports, Sports Information uh, Director Mike Jewell here at IPFW, and yours truly, Mike Maz. We're going to talk about the media and IPFW athletics. Our show is Mastodon Spotlight, and it's coming up next. Hi again, everybody. I'm Mike Maz. Welcome to another edition of Mastodon Spotlight. A little different format this week. Uh, we're not going to cover a team, per se, here at IPFW. Instead, we're going to talk about media coverage of IPFW athletics. And I'm um, very pleased and honored to have some special guests here this week. To my immediate right is Blake Sebring from the F Fort Wayne News Sentinel. And to Blake's right is Mark Franke, who uh, covers volleyball. Uh, for uh, women's volleyball here at College 56 Sports and also host the Arnie Ball Show, uh, which will start later in January. And to Mark's right is uh, IPFW Sports Information Director Mike Jewell. And uh, it's possible we may have another guest later on, but uh, we'll see how things progress there. But gentlemen, first and foremost, thank you for uh, coming in today. And um, the topic is media coverage of IPFW athletics. Uh, Blake, we'll start with you. You've been around here longer than any of us, <laughs> and you've covered uh, primarily men's volleyball, but some other sports. Um, I guess in a nutshell, to start off, talk about the coverage of collegiate athletics in general and IPFW in particular. Well, I think it's two different issues. Um, we're trying to figure out how to cover IPFW right now, how much is deserved and how much does the public want. And that's uh, it's something we're struggling to find out right now. And I think the school's struggling to find out right now. But we don't, we're not going to cover them as we do Purdue or Indiana. The, the interest isn't there for that. So we're trying to figure out how they do fit in. It's interesting. And, and I know you've covered not only IPFW athletics, but you've also covered Indiana. I remember when you would covered football for a couple of seasons. And you've covered the Fort Wayne Comets for forever and a day <laughs> uh, from the pro professional aspect. And we've covered high school sports as well. What's the big difference in your mind between trying to cover a professional team, a collegiate team, and a high school team? Well, the greatest difference I, is the, the pro athletes are usually older, so they've got more life experiences. They don't treat it like it's the be-all, end-all of their lives. They have other aspects of their lives which are more interesting. And the colleges have a little less, but they still have more than high school, where a lot of the high school kids, particularly their parents, think it's, it's everything there is to do. And, and you just this perspective, I think, is the biggest difference. You mentioned that your newspaper, the New Sentinel, is trying to figure out how much coverage to give. Obviously, one of the people that you and the other colleagues at the paper have to rely on is Mike Jewell. Uh, one of my, Mike's main functions is to supply the media with boatloads of information. Mike, you and I have talked in the past Obviously, you're one of the most overworked people in this <laughs> facility, in this university, and I'm being flat honest on it, you're one-man sports information department trying to cover 16 sports. Um, once you get a chance to come up for air, how much pressure do you have from the media in supplying them information? Uh, I actually, I don't consider it pressure. I enjoy working with them. They're great to work with. Uh, whatever I can give them is what I need to give them and how quickly I can get it to them is probably the best way we're going to get any publicity whatsoever. Right now it's tough definitely juggling two Division One basketball programs because everybody's all over the place 
and uh, just trying to get ready for game notes sent to the other schools is even tougher because you're trying to get that done plus you're trying to get all your stuff to your media as quick as you can uh, Blake and Rich have been great because we've got a little set style going right now for a little basically outlook of what's coming up that they have me do each uh, basically before each game hopefully a couple days before <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So I think that's going to actually pan out to be pretty good. It's just one of those things. It's going to take time. You can't assume that everybody's going to want to read IPFW right away. I mean, we've got to slowly ease into this. We're, we jumped in full feet head first, and uh, we've got a lot to do. We've got a lot of catching up to do, but we've got to be patient more than anything. Mark Franke, you're in a unique position where uh, you work with the men's volleyball team and you also broadcast women's volleyball with uh, Ryan Parade here on College 56 Sports and you host the Ernie Ball Show during the men's volleyball season. So you're a coach, you're a broadcaster, but you're also uh, a public fan because you watch the men's basketball and the women's basketball and, and we're probably gearing more towards basketball and volleyball coverage this week uh, as opposed to some of the other sports, although we may get into that a little bit later. From a fan's perspective, how much coverage do you hope to receive, you know, to see IPFW get, be it from the print side or from TV? Well, I know that uh, people who follow the teams, especially when we're on the road like our basketball teams are so much this year, with our first year in Division I, uh, they look to the papers to report the scores or the TV's late broadcast uh, for their sports broadcast. And so they like to see the scores reported, the box scores, if, if there's an article on it. Uh, I, I know that uh, that helps when, for instance, we're on the road, the men's volleyball team, and not only do we call the scores in through Mike and to the various media, but also typically Arnie will call Blake, and that will allow Blake to, to flesh out the story, so to speak, for his readers the next day. And also, uh, just the coverage of the games on Channel 56 does an awful lot, because I have people talk to me about how they they saw us play on TV, and they're not particularly volleyball fans in the traditional sense, but they watch because we're on. And I think probably that helps the basketball teams as well. It's too bad we can't uh, cover more sports. Yeah, I think 56 does a great job and should do, I know they don't have the finances, but I think that should be a priority for the school because you look at what we, they did with the volleyball program throughout the 80s. That's how they built the program. I mean, they were thousands of people who may not have come to games, but they were IPFW fans. And then when the Final Fours would come or something like that, they were always out to support it. And I think that's how they built the fan base. I think, uh, as I recall back when we first started televising in the late 80s, um, there was an argument going on. If we put a, the, the uh, games on TV, we'll cut our, our gate. And in fact, I think just the opposite happened because people who wanted to follow the team could follow the team even when they couldn't make the game in person. If they were somewhere else, they could videotape it and, and watch it later. And people who had just a passing interest didn't realize the quality of volleyball we were playing at that time would be channel surfing or see the promo or whatever and say, well, you're playing USC, you're playing UCLA, I need to watch that. And I think it really helped us develop a following for the late 80s and early 90s when we became a national power. Yeah, and you could always replay a big win over and over and over. I mean, how many times did we see the Stanford match on TV? I mean, that just really helped, I think, really helped the program because it just kept reinforcing that these were a national power. And that, that's really nice to be able to replay a win because typically the coaches replay the losses yeah, exactly. and make the teams <laughs> watch those. It, it may go into the games an event that they've kind of lost. When we talk about an event, and uh, like uh, for example, we're looking forward very much here at College 56 come January the 11th. It's the opening of the men's volleyball season and Long Beach State. Uh, Arnie and I, I had Arnie on the show last week and and I kidded him, I said, just a ho-hum opening opponent. And you can imagine what his response was. But can we you open print it? <laughs> 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 but we, we open up against Long Beach State here at the Gate Sports Center, and we're going to be able to broadcast it on College 56 Sports. And, and, and it, it is an event. Um, and some people may not like what I'm going to say, but it's a fact. Volley men's volleyball, and to some degree women's volleyball, is still the elite sport here on campus. I know there are some factions that are hoping that men's and women's basketball will have not sup uh, supplanted, at least get it up on an equal basis. But volleyball is still the sport, and Arnie's done a heck of a job over the last 22 years in trying to promote it. Um, we've got this event, and we're looking forward to broadcasting it on TV. 
I know you've covered the team and, and everyone's looking for better things this year because last year was an uncharacteristic year for IPFW Volleyball. Now, in preparation for that opening match, how much work are you going to have to do? Honestly, Mike, I haven't even thought about it yet. <laughs> I've been so busy with everything else, I haven't even looked at it. I mean, I've talked to Arnie casually a few times, but I haven't had a chance to even look at it. That's how busy we've been. I'm you sorry. Need some, you need some help, though. Well, that's not going to happen either. Mike <laughs> needs a lot of help, too. I mean, <laughs> you said Mike's the most overworked man. And Mike's the most overworked man in this city, and that's the school's fault. That is a huge problem for the school. He can only do so much, and uh, he needs help. He needs some help. Okay. I mean, last night, the basketball game was at Florida International, and he was working on that until, what, 1 or 1.30 or About 2? one. And he was in this morning at 7.30. That's insane. And I blame the school for that. I blame the school totally for that. That is, that's abuse. And I think that's the biggest problem right now for Division One. is I don't see any differences from what they had at Division Two, except they're making people do a lot more work. And that's wrong. And I think that's very, very wrong. How do they correct it? Well, they got to spend some money to make some money if they're going to do it. Right now, they don't have the money to spend. It's a, it's a huge problem. They're not going to ever be successful until they can start acting like a Division One instead of acting like a Division Two that's trying to be Division One. And I don't know that they're going to be able to succeed. And they're just, they're just very, very lucky that they got such great people working here. That's the only thing that's saving them right now, is people like Mike and Mark Pope and Dan Clark and, I mean, people that are just great people and who care about this school. And they're, right now they're saving this place. Want to comment, Mike? Uh, I mean, from my end, I, I just enjoy doing it. I've always done it. I've been doing it since 1992 when I was in college. And basically this is all I know. Working late hours is not strange to me. I mean, I'm just happy that I'm working in something I enjoy. Uh, a lot of times you don't get to do that. And yeah, occasionally long hours, you have to go into it. But summertime, hey, I look forward to that vacation. <laughs> How I mean, many hours did you have to work on Thanksgiving this year? Uh, I only worked, what, about an hour, two hours to get that stuff done. So it wasn't that bad. Actually, the wife was happy. She would kick me upstairs <laughs> to do it. <laughs> but still, you're having to do work on a holiday where most people have the day off. Um, well, but that's kind of the one of the unique things about sp sports. First of all, two comments regarding the working on the holidays. We play on weekends. For, so for four months, every weekend, we're either gone or we're playing at home, which means the whole weekend is disrupted, or at least revolves around those Friday and Saturday night matches. Now, obviously, being at home is easier than being on the road, although, as Mike says, our wives typically are glad to see us go on the road for a while sometimes. <laughs> but the other, the other comment is that we've done an awful lot on a shoestring budget around here. Not only is Mike a, a one-man shop, but if you look at what Arnie's done, he's never had a full-time assistant until this year. I'm a volunteer assistant with a day job. Uh, Denny Johnson's a teacher. At least I work here. It makes it a little easier for me to arrange my schedule because the chancellor and, and the vice chancellor are very supportive of my helping. Denny works as a public school teacher, and so for him to be able to go on the road with us is difficult. Uh, Lisa and Roger Horman have, have been with us the last couple of years. They work for the city, and they have to take vacation days or try to get a work around their schedule. So it's a lot has been accomplished by people who've either volunteered time or worked well beyond the, the normal call of duty to make this happen. As Blake says, now I think maybe we're poised to take the next step, but we've, we've, got, to be, we've got to be successful, I think, on the floor in order to generate the additional revenues that we need and, and the support to, to take care of some of these overworked situations. Which is going to be a problem this year because right now Arnie's team is the only one that has a chance to have a winning record this year. And that's, that's a problem. Fort Wayne has a long history of only supporting winners. It's a very fickle sporting community that way because they would, they would rather go out and, and watch their own kids play, which I got no problem with. I mean, but they would much rather do that than pay to go see someone else play. And they've always been that way. Mike, you, you did work back when the Fort Wayne Wizards came into existence. Um, Briefly go back to yesteryear. Uh, that was a new product, and, and there were issues in the, in the building of the stadium, I remember, way back in the early 90s, because there was a faction of people that did not want it. They said, Why? Uh, it's going to cost money. Blake, you're right. This town, for whatever reason, they only support a winner 
both from showing up in the stands and from generating revenue. Uh, and and baseball the had the advantage. There wasn't anything else like, like it in town. I don't think IPFW has that option right now because so many people are IU and Purdue and Notre Dame fans. That's, they're really difficult. They're up against it for that, too. When we were in our um, heyday, uh, had our best teams, we, we actually filled the Gates uh, Arena a couple of times. But it was when we were playing teams like USC and Stanford and so forth. And those were years when we were a legitimate national contender. And so clearly fans will come out when, um, when you're winning. If we're playing a, a lesser team, obviously we're not going to get the fan support. And we always worry about in the spring, are we up against a home Comets game? Are we up against uh, IU or Purdue playing basketball that night on TV, especially in March when we get to the uh, NCAA tournament for basketball? Those things affect the, the fan turnout. And that's why like we talked earlier, Blake, about why Channel 56 is important. Yes. Because if you have to make a choice, at least you can either watch it on TV or tape it and, and watch it later. And it allows you to continue your support of the team even when you can't be there in person. And volleyball is unique, too, because it is a distinctly different sport from the other ones. I mean, it has its own niche of fans that it can draw off of. And that's something else that the other sports right now haven't got. Soccer maybe can do that. It yeah. Soccer has a couple soccer things going really for it. Soccer was really doing it when they were Division Two and yeah. going for the national tournament, and now they've kind of stepped back and they got to start over. they got to start over. But but they do have uh, what Arnie was able to draw on with volleyball is that volleyball is a very important recreational sport in Fort Wayne. Soccer has also become that, especially among kids. And I hear you know young people, high school, college, and, and in their 20s, talk about IPFW soccer a lot, but not only um, by drawing on that but also having the soccer showcase where they bring in IU and some of the national contenders that helps. I know Arnie mentioned last week that one of the big issues that's going to come up as far as saving volleyball on a national scale is that there has to be TV. We're fortunate here we're one of only two universities in the country the University of Hawaii being the other school that broadcasts uh, College volleyball live. I think BYU does something, but it might be radio. Occasionally, yeah. BYU does radio. Yeah. yeah. But Arnie said it's critical for the sport of collegiate volleyball to get a TV, a national TV contract. How do we go about it? Any ideas? Well, I, I know Arnie and I have had a lot of discussions when you're driving across the Midwest at three in the morning, and it, you know the buses are great, but there are times when you can't sleep there. Or, you get in the hotel room and just fed the team. It's one o'clock and you're not ready to <laughs> quite wind down yet. We we talk about a few these adult things. beverages involved. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're I'm of German experience, so little German Kool Aid never hurts. I, I'm really surprised at that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we we talked about. This. I, I know Arnie Arnie worries about that, and what, but what worries me, and this is where I disagree with Arnie, is I think they're playing so much with volleyball as a structure, as a sport, because they think one more rules change will get us that national contract. And I just think volleyball and a lot of these sports are up against so much competition for, for TV time and dollars that, that it is an, an uproad thing, or an uphill thing. And I, and I don't know what the answer is. I just worry that they will change volleyball to the extent that it's not recognizable for those fans who, who played it in park board leagues and so forth, and they lose their core of their support. We're going to take a break, and uh, when we come back, we'll continue our discussion of the media, coverage of IPFW athletics, and who knows what else, but that's when Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. For over three decades, Dr. James Owen has been credited for helping IPFW become a top-rated school through not only teaching, but also his involvement in the Fort Wayne community. The kind of people that the city w were hiring at the time were people with advanced computer skills. I thought, my lord, unless my students get up to speed in this particular area of uh, skill and talent, knowledge, uh, that they weren't going to be competitive in the job market. Dr. Owen developed courses that would train his students to become leaders in the community. At one time, of the six major department heads in the city of Fort Wayne, uh, three of them were former students of mine that I'd recommended for the job. He makes a point to stay in touch with former students, and that makes a difference in their lives. Uh, whenever I think about undergraduate days, I always think about old professor so-and-so. She said, I have one like that, too. And she said that that's Dr. Owen. IPFW, the right school, right here, right now. 
look, this is me. And my mom and dad. And my big brother, Alex. And Jack. This is the day I learned that sandals got their name from sand. And that the ocean is bigger than all of us. This is the day we all got to forget I was sick. This was my wish. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, it kills over 1,500 people every year and injures 71,000 more. Inadequate sleep has been linked to health and safety risks, even premature death. But today, new treatments are helping millions get the sleep they need. So talk to your doctor or take our free risk assessment on the web at sleepfoundation.org. Sleep deprivation. It's real, it's dangerous, and it's more treatable than ever. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight, uh, a unique edition of the show this week <laughs> as we are discussing the media and coverage of IPFW athletics. Our special guests are Blake Sebring of the Fort Wayne News Sentinel. Mark Blake may not be a guest for long. <laughs> <laughs> I think the university police are on their way over to pull him out after the ran of that last segment. <laughs> we, we got some more to come. Uh, to, to Blake's right is Mark Franke, who uh, doubles not only as an employee. used to have a job here. <laughs> <laughs> used to be an employee here at IPFW and, and also uh, uh, hosts Mike. the Arnie Ball Show in, in men's volleyball season and works women's volleyball with Ryan Perrott here in College 56 Sports. And as we've alluded to a couple of times earlier in the program, the most overworked man no, not only at IPFW but in the city of Fort Wayne, uh, Sports Information Director Mike Jewell. And, and um, if we could only get the real thoughts and feelings, guys, uh, <laughs> how, uh, how it goes. One area I wanted to get into, and, and we were hoping to have a couple of other guests today, and evidently they're not able to make it. But in covering IPFW athletics, obviously you have to build a rapport uh, you and Arnie, for example, because you cover volleyball, um, but in other sports, as a reporter, you're always trying to find out every and anything. And, uh, and the question is, when you find out particular information and a coach asks you not to do anything about <laughs> it, where do you draw the line as to whether you do report it and write about it or whether you don't? Nine times out of ten, I'm the one telling the coach what's going on on that kind <laughs> of thing. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, that just never happens. It just doesn't. I mean, it's just not an issue. Um, you know, I think one of the great things about this place is that they do have the right people in place as coaches. They got great people as coaches. I mean, they have the perfect people in the perfect spots. You're never going to find a better coach for this place than Kelly Hartley, and she's just fantastic. And they, they're lucky if they can keep her for as long as they do. I mean, they if anyone deserves a lifetime contract, there it is. And Bruce Patterson and, and Doug Knoll are the perfect coaches for for uh, basketball, and Terry Stefankowitz, I mean, I don't know how anybody does what he does. I mean, coaching two teams like that, he, he's amazing. He's my hero. I mean, how he does that. Um, and the other thing is, I'm out here all the time, so it's not like I'm just surprising the coaches and showing up and saying, hey, I hear about this, and, you know, I'm out here all the time, so we've got a pretty good relationship with all the coaches and stuff, and, and um, you know, it works. You mentioned earlier that your newspaper as well as the Journal Gazette, obviously there are concerns about how much coverage should be given. What is your personal feeling how much coverage should be given and what is the paper's official position? I think we're still finding out. I mean, they had 2,000 people at the opening basketball game, but you know, less than 1,000 of that was paid. So how do you judge? But I mean, some of that unpaid though are students oh who, sure, who I understand have that. basically how many, the, the bought question season I, tickets to everything through their sure. uh, uh, fee. The question I have though is how many people don't show up that night, but how many people show up the second night over here against, I think it's Chicago State? Yep. I mean, that'll be really big. And the other problem is you can't, it's really hard to take away coverage from something else. It's not like we can add more people right now to do it. So, you know, every high school basketball game out there draws at least 2,000 fans every night. And then, you know, if IPFW can't do that, how do you justify taking coverage away from that or taking the coverage away from the comments who get 6,000 every night, and you know you're not taking it away from Indiana, Purdue, or Notre Dame, that's, that'd be suicide. Yeah. So how do you justify, and it's a tug of war. It's that really difficult right that's now. That's part of what we're competing for, not just competing for the fans' attention, but we're competing for column inches and sure. Blake's paper and, and other media. Um, and if, 
if you're competing like our basketball teams not only compete against i u and produce basketball which have big followings in fort wayne but high school basketball is very big obviously and in indiana and especially in the in the the rural areas around fort wayne where they have those two thousand per night crowds so that's that's tough too you know one thing that was really hard about opening night for basketball it was the same night as semi state for football and there were four teams playing and you know there was three thousand people from fort wayne in each game you know that was really really hard and and how do you justify sending two people to the basketball game which is you know two thousand folks or whatever and not double covering the football games and that was the bullet we had to bite when we first went to uh, ncaa which is probably what early to mid 80s 86 i thought was it? okay um, we had the discussion about how do we build fan support and at the time there were there were some of us who were in the minority in fact if i'm with them they're always in the minority we know that <laughs> <laughs> but thought that it's it's a long-term process that you work at developing student support because most of our alumni are front uh, first of our students live here and most of them stay here and so you you can build that alumni support because they, they remain local and at that time I thought no we have to really look to the community to 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 bring in fan support now, i'm really encouraged um, this year that the student government has taken it upon themselves to be very active in generating fan support for basketball and i a lot of i i think we probably had 500 students um, no, at that at game, that's a lot for yeah. a basketball game for us, because they did they built a homecoming kind of thing around it, and they had a little uh, had a concert afterwards. So if, if they try to integrate athletics into the students' social life with the other things that are going on, I think it helps the campus as a whole, but also uh, is uh, pretends well for the ath long term viability of the athletic program. Two points. It would really be helpful and help make our decision easier. People bought more papers because of coverage of, the, of IPFW. That would make things a lot easier and it would be a really clear sign that hey we do need to pay more attention to this. And the other problem is, and this is the school's biggest problem, and even the coaches are using it as a recruiting tool. They don't tell the kids, well you can graduate with an IPFW degree. They say you can graduate with an IU or a Purdue degree. And that is the biggest problem because a lot of these kids that graduate from here, they don't say they graduate from IPFW. They say they graduated from IU or Purdue. The school has to somehow find a way to build its own distinct identity. And I think that's part of the reason they went to Division I was to try to do that. But that, that's, that's really, really hard to do because, you know, like we said, you're competing against IU and Purdue for attention. And, you know, if most of your own students would rather watch those, then you're, that's really difficult. The short-term goal probably is to get on board and, as I say, get more coverage. And I know, Mike, you're probably inundated amongst uh, not just the papers but the three TV stations here in town uh, you know get us info get us info get us info uh, how do you see the war and it's it is a war let's make no <laughs> bones about it oh, you've I don't got, know about you've that. got let's talk. there's well, wars. Got there's <laughs> wars going on right now. <laughs> well yeah maybe that's a poor choice of words um, it's a it's a struggle yeah good 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 choice of words but you, as you say you've got IU and uh, IU Purdue and Notre Dame Football, basketball, um, and we've got you know here we are, tiny little IPFW, or or they still show it on uh, on ESPN in some cases IUPU Fort Wayne. <laughs> um, here we are, the little uh, sliver. And how do, you know? It's a it's a tough road to hoe, yet expectations are high. So you know we have to dig in for the long haul, but for the short term, you know what can we do? What else can we do? Well, I mean, right now I know I'm plugging away on just little things, like for basketball. Of course, we got to report to ESPN and Fox Sports. Well, after talking to ESPN uh, the last couple of days, finally saying that we're not IUPU Fort Wayne, we're IPFW, I went on the website this morning at ESPNGo.com, uh, and finally they got our little logo up on their web page. They're finally. But it's one of those things, it's a slow process. I mean, you just can't expect us to flip it overnight and all of a sudden get national exposure for basketball and some other ones. Volleyball, of course, is still going to be up there. You're just going to have to be patient. It's called plugging away. You just constantly go after it. And like Blake said, yeah, if I had another person in there, I could probably bury Blake alive with two people. <laughs> Blake, Blake then would want to come after me and probably take me out somehow but yeah, take you out to dinner <laughs> <laughs> but I mean for the most part it's gonna be a slow process 
I mean, if basically the readership's got to have X amount of papers, IPFW, maybe I'll go down to the New Sentinel one morning, buy up 5,000 of them and say, Blake, hey, guess what I got? <laughs> Even though that wouldn't work. that budget. <laughs> 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 then Take your wife up. might have something to say, Mike. <laughs> yeah, that's my Christmas bonus. No. <laughs> Five thousand papers at fifty cents a paper. Yeah, I mean, but that—that's the thing. We're just going to have to keep plugging away, and what's going to have to happen is the teams are going to have to start winning. Once they start winning, people will start coming. People want to know us, and it's only going to take one or two times that you're actually going to have a big thing. I mean, look at Ball State right now. They're riding on a biggest high they probably had in a long time in basketball since Chandler Thompson was there. Well, guess what? They got two more games and they face us. We go down there and knock off number 16. You don't think IPFW can have a big high then, too? I mean, that, that will get you known. But the thing is, it's just going to take time. we got to be in the right place at the right time. In that case, we will be going up against Michigan State. Hey, who knows? If you do take out Michigan State, you probably got most of our big guys. Shock. Yeah, it'd be a shock, but it's something that can be done. I Not mean, with this rebounding. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> you know... Everybody always pointed to Valpo when they were talking about IPFW going to Division One. Look at Division One did for Valpo. I was at Valpo when they started that. They lost a million dollars a year for probably ten years, and I don't know if IPFW can afford to do that. And Valpo is a private school; they could write it off. And IPFW as a public school is not allowed to do that. So, you know, I mean, they gotta. It's going to take a long haul, and people forget. You know, it took Arnie twenty years to build the volleyball program to where it is, and he was doing it with all local kids mm -hmm. mostly. That's not going to be an option with the basketball teams. It might be more of an option with the women's basketball team, but it's certainly not going to be an option with the men's basketball team. And it's, it's going to take some time, and I don't know that IPFW has that kind of time. One of the issues that uh, we face in that is, is in recruiting. And obviously in the past where scholarships have been um, underfunded pretty much in every sport, that's, that's been a problem. Uh, and now the scholarship budgets are being increased by, uh, which are funded through donations from from the community. Uh, that's going to help, but it's still it's this is still a, a difficult campus to recruit to because we're as you said earlier we're not IU and we're not Purdue, and students understand it and and we don't have dorms and so it doesn't look like a real campus and and so there's a lot of things that the coaches when they go outside of our our immediate area have to recruit against. In the case of Arnie Ball, who is the one I understand best, he's recruiting against Ohio State and Penn State, um, and perhaps even recruiting against um, uh, the West Coast teams, and that's difficult. Yeah, or I can't count how many times he's been the second choice of after kids who went to Pepperdine or UCLA. I mean, from Wisconsin or yep. St. Louis or. It happens all the time. And if he goes after a different type of kid, then he's recruiting against the Lewis Universities and the Loyolas, who who are private, and in those cases, they're, they're Catholic schools, and they can offer something that, that we can't. So he's really in the middle, and, and most everybody else he recruits against is on one or the other extreme. And it makes it difficult to be something other than, than second place frequently. And as I understand it, the scholarship dollars aren't there. I mean, the full, there's nowhere, they're nowhere near what the full complement of Division One scholarships are. They, they're much closer to what the minimum are. And so you're, you're dividing up your money even further to try to compete. And I know Arnie difficult. made a comment last week, and I don't think he'll mind me saying it. One of his, I use the word concerns, is that men's volleyball gets four and a half scholarships. Men's basketball next year will have 13 scholarships. Women's basketball, by mandate, will have 15 scholarships, and women's volleyball has 12. And there's a big disparity there. Uh, regardless of the sport, there's still a disparity in the allotment of scholarships uh, given. It's because that, of that football four. and gender not in Title IX. Well, that four and a half, though, uh, for Arnie is an NCAA limit. It's not an right. IPFW limit. Uh, and the other three sports are going to be fully funded for the first time. and should be able to compete at least financially on an even keel with with who they're recruiting against but i guess you could say technically arnie has his four and a half and most of the others have four and a half in men's volleyball and so financially they're they they should be even but that's not true sometimes it it doesn't work out that way in a kid's mind based on the total cost and other financial aid that might be available at a particular college especially the private schools if if they decide they like a kid they can give him a scholarship out of x fund and call it a scholarship where IPFW can't do that. I mean, they may end up having eight or nine scholarships instead of the 4.5, but they can say they're academic scholarships or 
uh, some trust fund scholarship or something like that and get around it. And there's no way IPFW can do that. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. My understanding is, is that IPFW is not allowed to get any help financially from both Indiana University and Purdue University, uh, especially in the area of athletics. Am I, am I correct on that, as far as you know? IPFW is funded separately by the state legislature. Our, our state appropriation comes to us directly, it comes through Purdue University, but it's allocated for our campus. Same way with our student fees, what we assess in tuition stays here. The campuses don't exchange money, and, and certainly our, the main campuses don't subsidize the regionals in a direct fashion like that. Now, what we can get from them, uh, and we've relied on this as we've been moving up in, in athletics, is we get a lot of advice. And we can, especially on the, the business side where I work, we rely on, on our counterparts in West Lafayette to help us get through certain things that we've never really addressed here before. And they're very free with that and very uh, open to, to helping us in that way. But financially, no, they don't subsidize us by sending us money to help us, um, help us uh, grow. We, we stand on our own two feet. Yeah, the only way they're allowed to take money is through ticket sales or donations, correct? Isn't that pretty much it? You get a little bit from student fees, but not a ton. Now there, uh, the student fee money that's assessed um, goes to help su support the program, especially in the operational area. Scholarships are strictly funded through donations, and so um, that money has to come from somewhere, and it, it has to be raised year after year after year, which is a difficult job for the athletic director. It's probably his primary job is to, is to provide the funding base for the, the program. We're going to take another little break, and uh, then I want to take that s one step further. And also, you know, look for some possible solutions, both on a short-term and a long-term basis. Obviously, there are some of us that would like to have IPFW plastered over the TV, the newspapers, and, and hopefully uh, soon to come radio as well. But uh, obviously, it's going to take some dollars to do it and maybe handshakes and who knows what else. But uh, we'll discuss those issues and more when Mass Down Spotlight returns in just a moment. Today's teenagers, the way people talk, you'd think they can't do anything right. It's just not so. We get to know over 300,000 kids a year, smart kids, who know what they want. They believe in themselves, and they believe in America. Some go straight to college. Others choose to learn leadership, discipline, courage, and commitment first with us. Today's military, making a stronger America, one good kid at a time. Was in another lifetime, one of toil and blood. When blackness was a virtue, the road was. If we do not take responsibility for saving animals from extinction, we allow a part of ourselves to die with them. Help World Wildlife Fund protect animals in the places where they live by ordering a free action kit. Together, we can leave our children a living planet. Come in, she said, I'll give ya shelter from the storm. Excuse me. Excuse me, are you Santa Claus? I heard you might be him. If you are him, here's my list. Help the Marines make Christmas possible for less fortunate children. Donate a new toy to Toys for Tots.
Welcome back to Macedon Spotlight. We've had a, uh, an enlightening conversation so far <laughs> this week uh, regarding uh, the media and IPFW athletics and uh, how the two can be intertwined and how they be to be separated. Um, our special guests are Mike Jewell, Sports Information Director here at IPFW, Mark Franke, who works for the university, uh, or at least he used to up until this time <laughs> to take the show, <laughs> and uh, also works with College 56 Sports and hosting the Arnie Ball Show and working women's volleyball. And Blake Sebring from the Fort Wayne News Sentinel, who has been around here longer than any of us, with the possible <laughs> exception of Mark, I'm not sure, but uh, Blake has covered IPFW athletics for the paper for quite some time. And Mark, we were before we segued out the last break, we, I asked the question initially uh, to verify that IPFW cannot get financial help, especially in the area of athletics, i.e. media and so forth, from both Indiana University and Purdue University. Yet here we are, we're now supposed to be one of the big boys in Division I and we're supposed to be able to fund this increased number of scholarships for all these sports. Uh, I mentioned 28 combined for men's and women's basketball, uh, women's volleyball, as Arnie alluded last week on the show, 12, men's volleyball, four and a half, Soccer, I know that Terry had mentioned in previous shows that uh, eventually it's supposed to get up into double digits. I think soccer uh, is limited to 9.99 yeah. or something like You're that. You're close to 10. The total, the total is 78 as a minimum, as a floor, uh, for scholarships to be awarded. And the reason, that's, reason that's a lot more than we've been awarding Division Two. Yeah, <laughs> infinitely a lot more. The reason there's a discrepancy is because football. Even though IPW doesn't have football, the limits for scholarships per sport are rigged so that the men have quite a bit less than the women so that if you have football at your school it evens out. It has to even out for gender equity. Well, do we put football on the agenda for five or six or eight or, or ten years? Go broke the whole wow. school would go bankrupt in three years because football costs that much to run. Just your insurance alone right now would be probably about a million dollars, I mean a year. It's insane. And the, and the travel, try to travel with a hundred people, what would that cost you? What would uh, what would the equipment cost? I mean, you'd have to spend probably five or six million before you ever played your first game. And yet, University of St. Francis, granted, it's a Catholic it's school. It's a private school, though. Private school, and they were able to start the program, build a stadium, and put some quality players on the field because they've had three very successful years uh, after the And they the did it all year. by f on loans. <laughs> I mean, it's basically all done. Uh, we'll pay you later. And I, there's no way IPFW could do it. It'd, just, it'd be physically impossible. Well, the other thing is they're obviously not Division One NCAA, and that makes a difference. And with a small private school like that, athletics sometimes can be a major recruiting emphasis for your school. For instance, uh, I might be off somewhat on the numbers, but I think I'm close. Lewis University, which uh, competes in the, in the MIVA against us, the men's team, what, when we were in the GLVC, they were a major competitor. It's a Catholic school up outside of Chicago. And they, I heard that two-thirds of their students are athletes. They have a team and everything. And when you go into their gym, they have all sorts of banners hanging around about their conference and, and national championships and, and competitions. But they recruit athletes. And they, they say, you know, high school kids, and I think St. Francis maybe is trying to get a little of this. I played high football in high school. And I'd really like to play in college, but I'm not being recruited by anybody. Well, St. Francis can recruit me. I can go there, maybe get a partial scholarship and pay the rest of the tuition myself, which helps the overall coffers in a school like that. And I have a chance to play college football. And uh, their turnover rate's pretty high. They have to keep recruiting a big freshman class every year. But if those students stay at a college like that, then they've increased their enrollments. And a, and a small private school is very, very much enrollment driven, even more so than we are. And a private school has the option, say it's, I don't know that Lewis does this, I'm guessing they do. If they, they bring in 40 kids, they don't necessarily have to raise the scholarship money for 40 kids. They can just write it off. IPFW has to raise that scholarship money for 40 kids. So they're behind already right there. I mean, that this private schools have that option. The private schools do a lot more tuition discounting than what a public school would do, where, where really the net tuition paid by any given student varies. And in fact, a large percentage of the tuition revenue, in fact, might be written off or, or discounted, as, as the accountants would call it. So we can't go within these state universities, and we're funded by the state legislature, and we have a general public that for well, the most part... you ticked off with the Corpus Christi stuff. 
Well, that's, that's another well, area. But, 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 even, but, but it's true. Even without that, the state legislature is not going to fund athletics. No. There are certain things on a state university campus that have to be self-supporting. Athletics, parking facilities, mm -hmm. some of these other things like that that are ancillary to the direct academic mission. So how do we, how do we get where we need to be? And, and it seems like we've got all our hands tied behind our backs. Mm -hmm. We're restricted in what we can do. We've got, and God forbid me for saying this, but we've got a very fickle public that they have arthritis when they try to reach for the wallet. Um, they also have this economy to work with, And too. you've got an economy that's, that's not the best right now, and yet we're trying to promote, and this was an optimum year for us, first year in Division I. Uh, I guess let me stop right here. Since we're doing the, the paid political announcement sort of thing, we made the decision to go D1. I know, I know what your answer is going to be, but I'm going to ask it for the record. Good, <laughs> bad, or indifferent? I think it's still to be determined. I mean, they started out behind, though. There's no doubt about that. But the timing, yeah. although we certainly didn't the know this in advance, horrible. turned oh. out to be horrible. I mean, they, they basically, <laughs> and I'm, they're going to hate me for saying this, they shafted about 40 kids. They ended their college's careers right there after the school year had started mm -hmm. before they could transfer or do anything. And the, the athletic director flat out lied. And he got caught. And they the timing was horrible. It could not have been worse. I think probably the, the person who most is suffering from that is the new athletic director, Mark yes. Pope, who's, who came in at a time when a lot of things were, were on a downturn and in a year that we really couldn't afford that. So uh, he's, he's a hardworking, good, bright man. I think he will, he will turn that around. But he is going to need some time. And I think in the long run, then, things uh, things should, should be better for us. And, and one of the reasons I believe that is what I mentioned earlier about student governments now getting more involved in athletics. If we can get our students more interested in our athletic programs, that improves the life of the student body, helps us recruit students. And so the whole university benefits from that. And then as they become alums, most of whom will stay in this Northeast Indiana area, they'll come back and continue to support not only by being in the stands, but also by contributing. You know, we eventually we'll get have a John Purdue Club or uh, um, what's one Indiana the Hoosier whatever the equivalent is in Indiana our, our Royal Dons Club is is not nearly to that level but at some point belonging to the Royal Dons Club will be seen as something important to do because it, it puts you in a in a group that is supporting something that you really believe in there's no doubt that IPFW has the right people in place I mean Mark Pope if he can't do it it's not going to get done and it's going to say a lot more about the community than it's going to say about IPFW in the long run but right now I mean, they've really, like you said, their hands are tied behind their back, and they're trying to fight through it, and it's a really difficult situation. I guess my next question would be, we talk about time, and we talk short-term and long-term. How long do you feel IPFW can tread water, so to speak, before we finally find the, uh, the life raft? What they need, and this is going to be really difficult, because Division Two, I would guess, what, 75% of the kids were local? Yeah, and that's going to be 25 percent at Division One because you're going to drastically change that. They need a Luke Wrecker to stay here and play basketball, and they, they need to do for the basketball program what Lloyd did for the volleyball program. They need a local kid that people can follow, who can really be great and maybe help them win. And I, think I don't know if that's going to happen. I, I don't know. It's, but I think that's what has to happen. Most of the recruiting, I think, still will be most will be primarily local because there'll be a limit on how many out-of-state kids can be brought in mm -hmm. because of scholarship considerations. Indiana residents pay about a third of what non-residents pay in tuition here, and so the coaches I know will be uh, looking in the local area to recruit because it. Uh, for financial reasons, secondarily, but primarily for what Blake said, local kids bring local fans with them. If if their families and friends followed them in high school, then hopefully they'll continue to follow them in college. And if they can play right here uh, on this campus, then that, that should help the, the draw at the gate. It's going to be hard because you know they're not going to win right away, and you, d you shouldn't expect them to win right away. But are those, and those kids, that's, I mean, are they going to want to come here if they know they're going to struggle for a few years? It's a tough sell. You've, you've you got, got the right people to make the selling pitch, but it's a tough sell. You, and you've got this cycle that seems to be never-ending. The coach, one of his recruiting tools can be, hey, we can get you playing time right now as a freshman. And they, they don't think about or they don't mention the fact that we may get our butts kicked a few times or more often than not. And, and so you've you got this little uh, seesaw back and forth 
Is it better to have playing time or is it better to have wins? Is it better to draw people in the stands or is it better to get media coverage? And it, it goes back and forth. And, and like uh, you, know, you mentioned uh, during the break, it's an unanswerable question, but yet there are some people in here that they're detractors of the university. There's some people, you know, they're, they're mad or angry because we went D1. You got some people, another faction within the university, and I can say this because I have three children who attend this university as students, and one of them is rather outspoken, and, and she says, why is athletics getting all the print, what print there is? Why don't we promote other facets of the university? So my next question is, and maybe it's good, better, and different, in the recruiting trails. And yes, we're, we're honing in on athletics and we're trying to get great student athletes, but in the recruiting trails, how much should be mentioned about the fact is IPFW is not just a school where you have athletic teams? Well, the chancellor likes to say, and he's, really, he's correct, that he already says that the athletic department and the theater and the extra, those are the marketing tools of the, of the university, and he's right about that. I mean, nobody's done more to make this university nationally known than the volleyball program, going to the Final Fours. I mean, that's the greatest marketing tool the school has right now. It's just, it's really tough, and they're hoping that by going to Division One, that it would be more marketable, and then that will attract more general students as well. If you talk to our admissions folks uh, who've been recruiting for a long time in this area, obviously IPFW recruits more high school seniors than any other college does it? I think that includes IU Bloomington and Purdue West Lafayette, and even Ball State, which recruits very well in, in Fort Wayne for obvious reasons. The thing they are up against is this image we talked about before. What, what, what are you really recruiting to? Are you recruiting to IU and Purdue at a lower cost? Or are you recruiting to IPFW? And I think what Division I athletics does, and the, and the dorms, um, when that, they come in a year, will make us look more and more to a 17-year-old like a real university as opposed to a second choice university or a, uh, uh, you don't hear this much anymore, but an extension center. Well, I, I was thinking about the dorm situation because obviously uh, uh, we're not a university without dorms. If we were, if we were going to be a true blue Division I university, you know, you've got to have the entire package. You've got to have the, the classes. You've got to have the facilities, and the facilities includes dormitories so that you hopefully can attract some out-of-state people. Uh, great first step in getting the dorm started, but how high do we go? And how, how soon should we put the emphasis on getting more dorms built? Well, I think there would be a natural limit as to how many students we, would, we could put in a dorm. Uh, obviously, the dormitories do a couple of things. They offer an opportunity, to say, for a high school senior to, to look at a more traditional campus social life or student activities kind of of uh, environment, but it also allows us to more easily bring in um, out of state, out of even international students who are coming maybe because of athletics, but also come because of some unique programs we have where in fact there aren't many around in the country or the world, or our reputation is very good and we compete very well on an academic reputation. And so having, having beds on campus uh, dorm rooms that they can they can rent makes their life much easier than trying to figure out can I get into an apartment complex then how do I deal with transportation back and forth and so forth so uh, it they will certainly help the athletic department recruit they will also help the general university recruit and in fact I th the people who are in charge of, of the housing are worried about how do we apportion those those beds that first year because they expect the demand to be well above the 500 or so that they'll have available how do you think they'll do it <laughs> if you answer that, you're crazy. <laughs> then you won't have a job. <laughs> a while back, especially when there was the, th the talk about moving to Division One, one comment that I heard from numerous circles, why don't we make a complete break from both Indiana and Purdue and change the name of this university? Feasible thought or idea, or do we still have to be remain... Uh, uh, the babies, so to speak, of those two institutions. I think we saw the opening night for basketball when there was 2,000 people there. I think that answered that. I mean, I, I really do. I mean, it, you, you're never going to get better media play than you got for that game. You're never going to get more TV coverage or radio spots. Look at the advertising they did for that. You're never going to top that. And you got 2,000 fans. I mean, I think that kind of answered that, unfortunately. I think um, the whole issue of the relationship to IU and Purdue, obviously it's a... Uh, 
it's one that's determined by the state legislature. But the, it's, uh, there's an emotional level to that. There's a political level to that. And by the time you peel those away, nobody knows what the is or is willing or even able to talk about what how would it affect us academically, how it affect us in, in other ways. So it, it's kind of a moot point. Back in, in the old days, it was talked about a lot, and I. I, you don't hear that much anymore. I mean, people, we've, we've established an identity that is unique for us. We feel that way. We feel the Fort Wayne community views us as something other than merely IU or Purdue. And so that's what's really important. And therefore, the, what we saw is the negative aspects of that relationship in the 70s, I think, for the most part, has been dealt with. But to, it, to do something like that certainly would be very risky. But if you'd have to get past that emotional tie, you'd have to get past that political uh, environment, and by then, I'm not sure the fight's worth it. What, what would, how much would we really accomplish by doing it? You know, and to go back to an earlier point, you were talking about what do they need to do. First thing, they've got to get in a conference. That might extend it a year or two if they were able to do that. And they just, they have to do that. And I know that's probably their first priority, I would think. But they, that has to happen. I'm told we're just about out of time. But boy, I want to thank each of you for, uh, for appearing this week. And if we could just get the honest, true thoughts out, uh, we'll have to work on that in the future. But uh, well, what amazes me is that uh, we actually stayed on topic. When Arnie and I do the Arnie <laughs> Hall show, we cannot stay on topic. Uh, call that a, a look at the host again. Better host. That's yeah. no better host, absolutely. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, call it a miracle, I guess if you want to call it that. But I want to thank each of you: Blake Sebring from the Fort Wayne News Sentinel, Mark Franke from here at the University and College 56 Sports, and. Mike Jewell, uh, I hope you get some rest. And uh, truthfully, it's a paid political thought. I hope you get some help soon because this can be exciting times for the university as a whole, the athletic department, and the community if, uh, if things fall into place. So uh, I hope you get some help. And uh, again, personally, thank you for all the help you've given me and given College 56. And I'm sure Blake feels the same way. Amen and trying to get us uh, so that we can do our jobs better. But uh, thanks to each of you for appearing this week on the show. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. That's it for this edition of Mastodon Spotlight. As always, we thank you, the viewer, for tuning in to see what's going on with IPFW Athletics. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this week's show, and we invite you to come back next week as well. But until then, this is Mike Moss saying have a great week, and go dance. week of December and that means that basketball is the main sport here on campus for the next three months or so. On this week's edition of Macedon Spotlight we'll be meeting with both men's and he women's head basketball coaches Doug Noll and Bruce Patterson and uh, hopefully have some players as well as the teams are underway and playing some good tough basketball. It's Macedon Spotlight and it's coming up next.
a tough and determined few dedicated to protecting everything we hold sacred. And still, they come. Celebrate the 225-year history of those proud few who have earned the title Marine. Hi again, everybody. I'm Mike Moss. Welcome to another edition of Mastodon Spotlight. Well, it's December, and that means it's round ball time. And uh, for the next three months or so, our efforts are going to be focused on the basketball programs here at IPFW. And our first guest this week is the head women's basketball coach, Bruce Patterson. And coach, first and foremost, uh, the season is now officially underway. <laughs> it's uh, in full swing, and we just have to make sure we prepare one game at a time now. When we last visited, uh, we were getting ready for this season, and we knew it was going to be uh, hustle, bustle, helter, skelter. Uh, you've had a chance to play six ball games so far, and um, in the next nine minutes or so, we're going to try to briefly review some of those games, and we're going to have some highlights from last Saturday's victory over Wright State. But let's go back to November 16th real briefly. Well, most of us were across the street at the Coliseum with the men's opener against Moorhead State. You and your women's team traveled to Chicago and you took on Chicago State from the Midcon, and you came away with an overtime one-point victory. Uh, it was a phenomenal experience. Obviously, it was a, uh, a big time for the, for the women's program uh, being the first D1 basketball game. It was a game that I, um, that I honestly believe that Chicago State didn't believe that we had a chance to win, and probably the only ones around that thought we did were, um, were sitting in our locker room before the game, and, and the kids just played with a lot of emotion, played hard, and, and we got a W. Came back from a five-point halftime deficit. A mm -hmm. um, couple of notes when I was looking at, uh, at the box score. You had four players in double figures, and you always like to see lots of players contributing. Amy Geralds had 29 points. Lindsey Warnst had 16. Kathy Hay, your 6'3 freshman center, uh, had 15. And uh, Hillary Kulik, and she's a gem. We're going to talk about her a little bit more. Uh, the transfers from Xavier had 12. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the one thing that stands out in my mind for the ball game, 11 of 23 from three-point range. And any time you can shoot over 40% from long distance, that's great. And you were nearly 50%. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I, I mean, I, the game started quickly with uh, Amy uh, Gerald's uh, putting on a on a barrage of uh, putting up a barrage of shots that all seemed to be finding the bottom of the net, and she did a great job with it. I, uh, you know, I really didn't think of it in terms of we were going to shoot a lot of threes, or we were going to take the ball inside, because quite frankly, the only Chicago State tapes that we had were of the previous year, so we didn't know what to expect. Um, we were just going in to try to do the things that we knew we could do well and uh, emphasize the points coming from players that we knew could, could get the, the shots down, and, and it worked out for us. From that game, you made a trip to Moorhead State, and it was a long bus ride, mm -hmm. and um, things didn't go quite so well uh, against Moorhead State. And uh, you came out on the short end of a 91-72 uh, score. Um, that contest, just, things just didn't go right, period. Well, actually, uh, Mike, I'll, I'll tell you that I thought the kids played pretty hard down in Mohead State. That game was a lot closer than the 18-point um, deficit that was uh, indicated in the final score. As you know, scores have a tendency to balloon right at the end simply because people start shooting foul shots and you start trying to foul people. But uh, I thought our kids played hard down at Mohead State. We had a few pieces of our game that were exposed, some weaknesses that were exposed in that game. They pressed us hard in the second half. Uh, uh, though we got pressed at Chicago State, uh, we were able to deliver a message to Chicago State early when they tried it that if you do this, you're going to pay a price. On the other hand, when we went to Moorhead State, for some reason when they pressed us, we didn't respond quite the same, uh, whether it was the long bus trip, whether it was lack of concentration, whether it was a better press. Um, whatever the reason, 
uh, we didn't respond as well, and that kind of shook us a little bit and, and uh, broke our confidence. I think that cost us. Uh, frankly, and all in all, I think Morehead State was uh, a little better team than we were. They had some nice inside play and some could get some points there. Um, but I, all in all, I wasn't disappointed with the Morehead State game. Come home, played the home opener against Army, and uh, it was a game that could have been won, uh -huh. perhaps should have been won, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, it wasn't won. Well, I think Morehead State had some effect there. Um, I mean, the tapes, obviously, that Army got of us uh, struggling with Morehead State's press, I think, cost us. Um, they came out and pressed us hard where we didn't see that press anywhere in the, in the tapes. Uh, we got it into the kind of game that we wanted, where it was an up-tempo game, and, and uh, we, were, we were competing with them, uh, I think, over the course of 35, 40 minutes there, 35 minutes there. Uh, I think they were bigger and stronger than we were, and I, that really cost us um, a little bit. I know that there was one point where uh, Laura caught an elbow that you don't, don't catch very often in, uh, uh, in lower-level basketball. Uh, their center was just a strong physical specimen, and she made us pay. Uh, so, I, you know, I congratulate Army on what they did. They did a nice job. Uh, on the other hand, uh, that is a game that I really would have liked to have seen us win. I think we could have won, uh, but we'd have had, you know, we, we're learning how to play at the D1 level. We're, we're learning that every game is, is competitive basketball. Every team has big players. Every team has somebody that can put the ball in the hole. So it was a learning game, a process for us. That brought us up to last week, and there were three ball games you had last week. The first two were on the road against Mid-American Conference teams, and uh, then uh, we had the Saturday home game, which we're going to show highlights momentarily of. But you took on Ball State, interstate rival, and uh, two days later, Bowling Green. Ball State, um, you were close for a while. I remember at one point in the first half, it was 30-23, and then... Uh, the lid in the basket got covered on, on our end, and they went kind of hog wild. And all of a sudden, you're down 17 at the half and end up losing big. Well, I interesting. As I said to you, the first game I thought we played real well. Each of the next two games I thought we played uh, well. I, I, you know, nothing uh, th that you're going to celebrate over, but we played well enough to, to win basketball games. And I thought in the first oh, 10 to 15 minutes of the Ball State game, we played well enough to, to uh, really uh, feel proud of what we did. And you're right, something happened. And, and whether it was from a coaching perspective, we didn't, do, we didn't pull the right strings, and that's where I always like to point when, when kids falter like that. Um, we, we faltered bad. I mean, we, um, and, and disappointingly, I think we, uh, somewhere at the beginning of the second half, we threw in the towel. Um, mentally, I mean, we mm -hmm. threw in the towel, and I and I wasn't very happy with that. Uh, we uh, we quit executing, we quit tra taking care of the ball, we uh, quit playing defense the way that the the kids are capable of playing defense, and and a what could have been a respectable quote respectable loss if there is such a thing uh, turned into a blowout, and and um, I apologize to our fans for that. Quite frankly, uh, we owe them better than that, and and um, we paid a price for it. Two days later, you went down to Bowling Green State, and um, I think the team played better. Bowling, straight, Bowling Green rather doesn't have that bad of a team, 73-57. Oh, I disagree with you. I think that's the worst game we played all year, Mike. It was, uh, and I think we had Ball State-itis there. I think, uh, I think we got caught in um, all the things that took place in the, the Ball State game. Quite frankly, Bowling Green's a game I'd love to play over again, and I'd... Uh, uh, I'm not a wagering man. I don't place a lot of bets, but I place it on us. I think we're a better basketball team. I think we got better pieces there. I, um, I frankly, um, you know, for a Mac school, if if uh, I, I just think we could beat them. Uh, I think they're well coached, and I think coach will tell you. Their coach will tell you that they're down a little bit on their talent level, and I hope this isn't sent back to their radio <laughs> station. But I, I think he'll tell you that they're down a little bit on their uh, talent level, and. And uh, we can win that basketball game. We could have won that basketball game. We should have won that basketball game. But I think the Ball State thing, where we really probably couldn't beat Ball State because they're, they're just flat better than we are and, and well coached also, we could have competed better. When we stopped competing there, it carried on to the Bowling Green game. Well, let's talk now 
about the game that we did win at home last like Saturday. I always like to talk about those first. And it's a game that we broadcast here on College 56 Sports, and uh, we're going to see highlights here. And uh, roughly about five minutes of highlights. This is in the first half. And uh, Wright State's got the basketball, and, and uh, I'll let you uh, comment. Laura gets the board, and we go down and we end up scoring. Yeah, um, I just, you know, part of our game is to get the ball up and down the court and to try to find the open player, and I think there's a case where Kathy Hay ran the court. I mean, you got a big kid that's running the court real well. She ran down, she was able to get it, maintain her balance after a little bit of bump, and, and find the open player. Uh, there, you know, you, you look at that and you say, boy, that's a nice shot by Hillary, but if you look right before it, you'll see uh, a double screen that was came off of, of uh, T and, and uh, Laura, and it's just as much what she did as what... Uh, I don't believe it or not what, what Hillary does. What you saw there was Tiara hitting Kathy inside, which is always nice to get, get the easy bucket. Yeah, they had a breakdown there. I'm not sure what that, that uh, inbounds play is really not designed to go to Kathy. She just opens up in case somebody uh, becomes brain dead, and they did. And, and um, when they did, uh, we got the ball in the, the hole. Uh, this is what I really like to see. Uh, you know, where we can get the ball down the court, we can get easy ones. Uh, we actually asked Laura, Laura to pull up there and to shoot the jumper as opposed like that one. That's what we want her doing more it's of. It's a lousy editing job. I'll be flat honest and I apologize. But, uh, uh, you can see I'm a rookie editor. But what you are seeing, again, yeah, Laura with the pull-up jumper. Hillary, at a prior play, she had hit two threes and she came back and uh, uh, he moved inside and got yeah, easy. He's a nice see, steal by Amy Gerald. See that? Those are the kind of things we want to do to teams. We want them to, to be looking for us when um, when they make mistakes. Um, we, we want them to pay a price when they do. And, and right there, the, the kid pulled out a little bit, backed away from the double, and and uh, then we just ran to the passing lane. Well, we're seeing some passing, and, and again, I apologize because uh, we're not seeing some of the finished product, but. Uh, Ball movement, if you say try to get the open person, there's another three-point field goal. Well, Wright State tried, tried to go into a zone on us, um, played a lot of zone on us, as a matter of fact. And, and I thought the kids did a really nice job, especially late of finding the seams in the zone, just like right there. I mean, we, That was the opening play of the second half. Yeah, that, well, that was actually a set play. It's, um, uh, it's just a high-low uh, setup, and we can run it against man or zone as long as the kid goes down and catches the right person to, to screen. What you're going to see here is uh, Laura Douglas is going to get a bucket. I believe he's going to move in, loose ball in here. She picks yeah, it up and yeah, steps she really in. Did, she really did a nice job. And, and you know, Laura's a really a, a good shooter from uh, 10 feet facing the bucket. And uh, what we're trying to encourage her to do is to shoot the basketball more from that range as opposed to well, the one where she took it all the way to the hole, we really prefer her to pull up at about five or eight feet. We think her success ratio is much higher there. Well, you saw Kathy Hay hitting Amy. Amy had the open jumper. See, right there is what we're really trying to get to. And we can try to get that little triangle against that zone. We get an overload and they're in trouble. That. They miss a shot and we're going to come back and score. <laughs> yeah, well, the, what, what happened there was one of our kids, uh, Amy did a nice job of stepping in on that steal. Um, we did a terrible rotation job up top. We attacked the wrong player, and it, all it takes is one kid when you press him to go to the wrong place, and they can end up with that kind of stuff. But even during that time, we don't mind that as long as we're taking it up and down and we're capable of uh, coming back and scoring on it. Another three by Hillary and a good pass from, uh, from Laura. Again, it's, it's nice They're looking for the open person. There's Amy with a three. It actually goes down. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Another three. Amy gets it back up and in. And uh, in this ball game, you had five players in double figures. Amy, Gerald's, and Hillary Kulik had 23 apiece. And uh, Kathy Hay had 13. Tiara had uh, 12. And Laura Douglas had 10. So it's a nice balance there. But beside the scoring, we got some really nice work defensively out of uh, out of all the kids, but T and and uh, Laura specifically. Uh, you know, they were they were bigger than we were, um, all the way through the lineup, and I just thought we did a good job on them. They, they did not get an opportunity to take advantage of their size inside. Ken, ball movement, inside, post. 
jumper. No, Bibbs with the offensive And we are a Bibbs made bucket there. And we're going to have uh, one more highlight coming up here. Turnover, and we're going to convert. And you always like to see that when you can convert uh, turnovers from the other team. And what's going to be nice here is it's going to be a nice pass inside. And the other bib puts it up and in, and that gave you a, a, a 12 point lead, and you extended it and ended up winning 89 78. So uh, it, was a, it was a nice victory, especially in front of the home fans. Yeah, it's always nice to come home, and, and it's always, you know, I told the kids before the game that we really were a team that, in my opinion, had our backs against the wall. Not necessarily because you have to win a lot of games this year, we're in a learning process. It, you know, I said at the beginning of the year, I could see us winning anywhere from 5 to 15 games. Uh, and if we were in that range in the 10, you know, 10 games, I'll, I'll be happy with the process that we've taken. More importantly, though, was the recovery from emotional letdowns that we had at Bowling Green. Uh, we emotionally didn't play with the same fervor that we did, I believe, in this particular game with Wright State. And that's important to us. I, I think we got to play at that level even if we're playing somebody that has a little bit more talent. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to speak with one of the members of this year's women's basketball team, Junior Tiara Dudley. But that's when Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. For over three decades, Dr. James Owen has been credited for helping IPFW become a top-rated school through not only teaching, but also his involvement in the Fort Wayne community. The kind of people that the city were hiring at the time were people with advanced computer skills. I thought, my lord, unless my students get up to speed in this particular area, uh, skill and talent, knowledge, uh, that they weren't going to be competitive in the job market. Dr. Owen developed courses that would train his students to become leaders in the community. At one time, of the six major department heads in the city of Fort Wayne, uh, three of them were former students of mine that I'd recommended for the job. He makes a point to stay in touch with former students, and that makes a difference in their lives. Uh, whenever I think about undergraduate days, I always think about old professor so-and-so. She said, I have one like that, too. And she said that, that's Dr. Owen. IPFW, the right school, right here, right now. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. Time now for one of my favorite parts of the program each week chance to speak with one of our student athletes here at IPFW. This week with women's basketball we have the chance to welcome to Mastodon Spotlight Tiara Dudley. Tiara, 5'10 junior from Ohio. Welcome uh, to Mastodon Spotlight. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about yourself please. Well, like I said, 5'10 junior from Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, this is uh, my third year but you know probably end up being here a couple of years longer but <laughs> <laughs> hey it's fine with me but um i'm a business major um i have a son which i think you said we may talk about um and i don't know i don't really how did you end up in Fort Wayne, Indiana from here? Cincinnati, Ohio? I have a lot of people who ask me. I don't know if it's just, you know, if it's like ask me where I'm from. Like, Cincinnati, how did you end up in Fort Wayne? Well, to be honest, I really didn't even hear about IPFW until, you know, um, it was late in, like, the recruiting, you know, season, actually. And I just got a call from um, Carl Smesco, who was the um, coach last year. And, you know, just out of the blue, he just said, you know, I got your, you know, your name and number. Actually from Coach Bowden, who was assistant coach, he used to coach for um, Wilmington College, which is, you know, up in Ohio. And we used to play tournaments there all the time. And um, we had a couple of our um, district, you know, championship we won there and everything. So he's seen me play before. And so that's where, you know, uh, Coach Mesco got my name and number, and I talked to him and everything. And I really wasn't, you know, set on what school um, that I wanted to go to or where I wanted to be at exactly for sure. And I was taking a visit actually to St. Joe, St. Joseph College in Rensselaer. And, you know, I told him I was going to visit there. And he was like, well, we're, you know, right around, and you can go there, and you can come here and visit us and things like that. I got lost. And <laughs> 
I'm for real. It took me like forever to get here, you know, but I'm glad. I'm I'm very glad that I did um, finally get here. And I just came and we ended up just walking around. It was dark, you know, like nobody was here. The people that was supposed to be here to, um, to, re um, to see me um, and invite me here, they left because I was like two hours late. And so I just talked to him, you know, we took a took a walk around the campus. I just really liked the, the atmosphere and what I've seen. And, you know, going to a, a couple of other colleges that I visit, um, visited were kind of like, you know, out. And um, it just really like the surroundings just really, you know, coming from Cincinnati, which is a big city, I guess I just felt like I would be, you know, comfortable in, in this type of of atmosphere and it was just a lot of a lot of things that surrounded the um, the university and it was just out in the middle of nowhere so <laughs> I think that's one reason why I came here I love the campus I thought it was a beautiful campus so well you got here and uh, you got to play some basketball and uh, talk about uh, the first couple of years uh, year number one which was Carl Somesco's first year here as well mm -hmm. 13 and 14 and one of the best records we've had in some time Last year, 19 and 8, and um, unfortunately, because of the transition from D2 to D1, we would have been eligible to play in D2. But uh, if we talk about the first two years here, and then let's talk a little bit about the transition now that we are Division One and playing mm -hmm. uh, the big girls, so to speak. Well, um, I thought my first two years here were, um, were uh, just a learning experience for me. I mean, the transition from high school to college was just something that, you know, I just, I never really, I guess, thought it would be, you know, as difficult, but at the same time, you know, you know, as, as exciting and, you know, just the worth ethic that, you know, you, that you have to put in day in and day out, you know, I just never really thought, you know, like, of, of how that transition was going to be. But, you know, coming here my first two years, you know, it was it was very exciting for me. And um, basketball was something that I just loved playing. And, you know, as long as I was playing it, you know, I was I was going to be happy. So, um, like you said, our first year, you know, we were we were just praised like, you know, <laughs> I guess like we were like the greatest <laughs> team ever. Because like you said, I think the year before that, they were like two. We were like two and something. Two or twenty-three. So just us. I mean, the first the first six games we came out, and I think we were like six and zero. Oh, and you know, everyone's like, oh, you know, like happy that we that we were even winning. And so you know, it was just it was a it was a great feeling. Uh, you know, like to you know, like I said, it was my like you said, it was my first year. It was Coach Mesco's first year, and so I was just excited. I was even the, I was I was given the opportunity to even come in here my first year and contribute to the team. You know, being a freshman, you know, I expected no matter where I was going to go, that you know I may not be able to play a lot. You know, it would have been kind of different from you know being a, a high school starter the whole four years I was in high school. So I was preparing myself for that also for you know being the um, the the supporter and the role leader in, in practices and stuff like that, but I was actually given a chance, you know, my first and second year to, to contribute and really, really help the team out, so I was very, very pleased with that. You've got a unique situation in that uh, you're not only a student here at the university and a student athlete playing on the women's basketball team, but you're also a mother. Tell us a little bit about the little one and then briefly talk about how you're able to juggle hitting the classroom, hitting the basketball floor, and being a full-time mommy? Well, my son's name is Tavion Jonathan Dudley. Nobody can pronounce his name, so we call him TJ. But anyways, he is like, he is, I think he's like the best thing that, that ever happened to me. You know, he, it wasn't anything that was planned, but it was something that, you know, I think just really, really came to me at, you know, like a, a good time in my life. And, you know, he, I, I love him to death. And, you know, he just really, you know, I guess built me as a person. And once I had him, my whole, you know, lifestyle, you know, my life period, it just changed. And I just, I'm, I've matured so much. And I think, you know, me having a son and, um, and taking on that responsibility and, you know, 
being a mother, I think it actually helps me, you know, on the basketball court also. I think that um, that is, it's made me um, just, you know, because it's not, it's not about me anymore, you know, it's about him. And then now I'm like, it's just about me worrying, worrying about other people. And I think, you know, uh, with me taking care of him and looking over him all the time. And then it's like when I'm out on the basketball court, you know, I find myself, you know, taking care of other people and, and looking after other people too, because that's just something that, you know, is just like built, you know, normal for me now. It's something that's just built into my life. And, um, and my mother, um, she came up here, you know, when I, in the summer of my, um, after my freshman year is when I found out I was pregnant. Um, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, if I was going to come back, when I was going to finish school. I had like no idea, so I was just kind of, it, it just actually stunned me. When I talked to Coach Mesco, I think Coach Mesco, um, you know, with that, I think he, without him and, you know, like all the support he gave me, I probably wouldn't have, you know, coming back. So. You know, I called him from Cincinnati. I mean, it wasn't even face-to-face -face talk to him or anything. I was like the nervous. I was, it was just like, uh, I didn't know exactly what I was going to do. When I talked to him, I just felt so, so good after I got off the phone with him because he, you know, told me he would do anything in his power to help me. You know, if I wanted to come back and play, it was fine with him, you know. So just talking to him just made me feel so, so much better about the whole situation. And so that's what I did. I came back up here and my mom came with me. Um, I mean, he was down here finding different organizations, finding different um, 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 people to help me. He got me in contact with, um, um, her last name I think is Newman. She works for the women's, um, it's like uh, women's study. It's some, 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 place here in Wild is like for working women, student type thing, and he got me in contact with her, which hooked me up with a lot of um, um, different organizations and things to do. So I think, you know, I, I love him for, you know, for what he done for me and everything, and I just, you know, managing my time and, and playing basketball, I just didn't know exactly how I was going to do everything. but. Like I said, he really helped me out. And my mom coming up here, she was just like my, my lifesaver because, you know, without her being here for me and, you know, taking care of him and stuff like that when, when I'm gone and when I'm playing, um, I don't know what else I, I would have done. So, I mean, it's hard work, but I'm definitely a, a worker. And so, you know, whatever I have to do, that's what I do. You know, whether it's staying up to midnight, one o'clock, doing homework, waking up early in the morning when he gets up, and that's just what I have to do, so. Hard worker that you are, uh, and especially on the basketball floor, um, eight points, almost six and a half rebounds, two assists a game, and you've been tenacious and aggressive on the defense. Uh, uh, we're almost out of time in this segment. Okay. We'd, I'd like to have you back later in the season, and if possible, to bring TJ with you. Okay. I think uh, when this is not, uh, happened before in the program, uh -huh. And uh, we'd like to have you back, and okay. we'll talk a little bit more uh, about Division One basketball, and, and uh, hopefully we'll see if he's got as much energy as Mom does. Okay. Hell, he does. <laughs> but, uh, thanks for coming in today, and okay. good luck, and uh, we look forward to chatting with you and TJ later in the season. Okay. Tiara Dudley has been our student athlete guest of the week, a member of the women's basketball team. We'll take a break, and then we'll bring Coach Patterson back because we're going to look ahead to two big ball games this week, both at home here at the Harry Gates Sports Center. But that's when Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. We're rejoined by Coach Bruce Patterson. And 
Coach. Two tough ball games coming up this week, but they're both at home at the Huey Gates Sports Center. Thursday night against North Texas and uh, Saturday in a game we'll televised on Channel 56 against Eastern Illinois. Brief thoughts on these two upcoming games. Well, we're going to see on Thursday the far and away the best team we've played. Um, they're big, they're strong, they're agile, they can shoot, they can take the ball inside, they like to run, and they can play defense. So we have, um, we have an outstanding challenge, and that's the way the kids have to really look at it. It's an outstanding challenge for a first-year Division One program to be taking on somebody that's I, they didn't get any, uh, they're not ranked in the top 25, but I know they were getting many of votes and they leave from here to go down and play Purdue. So, so uh, th this will be a, a chance for us to see where we stand relative to the best. And then a Saturday against Eastern Illinois. Well, we're looking forward to Eastern Illinois. Um, as long as we can get out of the, um, um, the Thursday night game in one piece, mentally and physically, and, and, uh, and, and with our confidence in, in uh, good standing, uh, then I believe we have a chance to win, win the Eastern Illinois game. Uh, uh, they're a basketball team that from, you know, you never go by they played, we played type stuff, but they've played some teams and, and have lost to some teams that quite frankly uh, in the cycle of things we, we think we could beat too. So, um, you know, we feel very comfortable with the Eastern Illinois game. We wish you luck. And uh, we will talk to you next week about these two ball games when you get to come back. But uh, good luck against these two falls. Uh, we're going to need them, and we always appreciate the help. Bruce Patterson has been our guest, head women's basketball coach here at IPFW. We thank him along with Tiara Dudley for appearing. We'll take a break, and then we'll talk men's basketball direct from uh, the Breslin Center on the campus of Michigan State University, where the IPFW men's team participated in the Spartan Coca-Cola Coca -Cola Classic this past weekend. So. Stay tuned, I, uh, Master Don Spotlight will return in uh, just a moment. Are you Santa Claus? I heard you might be him. If you are him, here's my list. Help the Marines make Christmas possible for less fortunate children. Donate a new toy to Toys for Tots. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. We come to you now from the locker room uh, at Michigan State University, the Breslin Center on the campus of Michigan State. And we're uh, going to chat with head men's basketball coach Doug Knowles. The IPFW Mastodons just completed play in the Spartan Coca-Cola Classic. Uh, Friday night they lost to Michigan State, 17th ranked Michigan State, 81-68. And uh, just a few moments ago, the consolation game ended and uh, the Mastodons came out on the short end of a 73-65 score, uh, losing to the University of Maine. And Doug, first and foremost, uh, I know it's been a rough go, but uh, briefly talk about the tournament just completed these two games in about 26 hours. Well, I, uh, we were really excited to obviously be here. I mean, this is kind of the mecca of uh, basketball, Mike. You know, you look at Duke, you look at Michigan State, you got your Arizonas, UCLA's, and and uh, these are just great places to you know to really be at, and and uh, it's a great just a great environment and it's just great for the kids I mean uh, you know this is what you want to do you know it's easy to go beat up on your little brother in the driveway or sister but you're not going to get any better as far as basketball goes and so what you've got to do is that you've really got to expand your basketball horizons and this is a great place to do it I mean we're uh, uh, you know playing Michigan State last night was a thrill in itself for not only the players but the coaches I mean we've seen the Breslin I've been here a lot you've seen them on TV and uh, then to coach uh, on the sideline was just a thrill as well and uh, we really played our hearts out last night and, and lost by 13 or whatever but uh, today we just ran out of gas and it, it really took a lot out of us a lot more last night than 
you would really think, but today it showed we just didn't have, you know, we had a half a tank of gas we were running on. Let's talk briefly about the game against Michigan State. As you say, Michigan State, uh, former national champion for the last three years, they've been in the Final Four, one of the few teams that has done that three years in succession. Uh, they come in, we come in and try to knock them out. They had a 46 game home court winning streak when we played them last night. And in the beginning, it was a game of runs. They scored the first four points. We came back and scored seven in a row. And three minutes into the game, we're at seven to four. And then they came back with an 8 0 run. And it was back and forth. And, and um, up until three minutes to go and a half last night, we're only down six, 23 17. And they made a little run to take an 11 point lead into the locker room. But uh, the fact, over 14,000 fans here at the Breslin Center, and uh, I think you agree, I don't think anybody in IPFW has played in front of 14,000 people before. But uh, to talk briefly, maybe about the preparation for this game and uh, against Michigan State, and as the game proceeded to go, granted we fell behind in the second half, but 81-68 uh, to the 17th ranked team in the country isn't all that bad. Right, yeah, and you know, I mean, you know, moral victories, uh, kind of, you know, they don't get it, but uh, last night I think was a, a big bonus for our program, and, and uh, I was I was just real pleased with, with the effort of the kids. I mean, we got into halftime, and we had 10 offensive rebounds. We're out rebounding them on the offensive glass, and they were only one rebound ahead of us. I mean, we got rebounding drills called Spartan Rebounding that we stole from them uh, because they're, they, they're just war on the boards. First five minutes of the game, we come back, and uh, we got three guys. Uh, we got two guys with blood on their teeth and the other guy is a fat lip and I mean, you know, that's Big Ten basketball and so, you know, we were uh, really given that look of what it actually happens in the trenches in Big Ten basketball and, they, you know, they welcomed us into, into the league, so to speak. And uh, it was spurts and runs and second half we really never, you know, threatened per se, but we really made a nice run with about seven minutes to go in the game and really outscored them in the last six, seven minutes of the game. Um, we put on a, a press, we got some pressure, and, and I mean, I think, as I mentioned, you know, because we did all that and because uh, we really pushed ourselves mentally and physically to the limit last night to play that team, uh, we just came back today and just did not have any uh, anything left, any energy left to uh, to compete here and we still only got beat by eight um, you know and it's very difficult because we thought it was a winnable game but any game you play anymore is, is tough I mean we could have sugarcoated the schedule we could have played 10 division one games and 18 non uh, there was no rule set rule because it's our transition year where we count if we play a division one but we don't have to play a division one but that's not going to get you any better and we've got to we can't look at this year I mean the seven footer they had today you know really hurt us I mean he had uh, basically 22 points, uh, probably five or six dunks, and that's the one position we're vulnerable right now because we got a couple big kids out. And You know, that's frustrating, but, uh, you know, you got to grow, and that's what we're trying to do. And, and uh, you know, we're not getting blown out of games. We're making them, uh, we're making them close, but we just got to find a way now uh, to get a little better and get over the hump. Some of the leaders on this team, the Nick Wises, um, your son Brad, uh, John Watkins, a transfer from Wright State, They've had, or especially in the case of Nick and John, they had a little taste of Division One coming in. And Brad, uh, as you said uh, in the press conference last night, um, he's where camps here, so he's a little bit familiar. Uh, do you think they were all by like, coming in here and playing in this tournament, or do you think they were a little bit more used to it than the other members of the team? Oh, I, I don't know that. You know, uh, when they came to camp, when Brad came to camp, there was nobody in the gym here. You know, it was just campers and. Uh, you know, it's a little different when 15,000 people are sitting in the stands. So uh, I would guess, you know, there's, you know, you have to look around the arena, but you don't want to try to make it like, uh, um, you know, Gene Hackman in the movie Hoosiers, you know, to measure the basket and the free throw line, you know, and, and yell out hickory because uh, it's the same as our gym, just a lot bigger. And uh, so is it. It's a thrill for the kids, and you know that's that's what we want to do. We want to try to play the best and, and play as many as we can. It'll it'll be great when we can settle down, get a couple wins under our belt, get some kids you know healthy, and uh, really work uh, at you know at being a little more competitive down the stretch. And and uh, but I, I think it was just a great thrill you know for us to be here in our program. Michigan State didn't need us, but because of uh, you know we're friends with with their. Uh, coaching staff, uh, we really felt like, you know, this was a great 
uh, opportunity for us. Let's take it. And, and uh, you know, we, we dropped two, but I think we, we gained a lot of experience up here this weekend. I don't know if you know it or not, but in the post-game press conference last night, Tom Izzo was asked, uh, how he thought IPFW would do. And he did comment that he said he felt that IPFW was a well-coached club, kudos to you and Joe and Fred, and that IPFW is going to win some games this year. So well, you know that or not, but that was a quote that, that Coach Izzo said in the press last night. Well, you know, we appreciate that, Mike, and, uh, you know, I have a lot of great respect for Tom. He's just a down-to-earth guy. I mean, you know, you get him in camp, and that's one thing Brad learned a lot about this, this year in camp was, uh, you know, how hard they work and, and you know he got to the level to experience exactly you know what they go through and I think you know that's helped him along the way uh, but you know Tom is just you know roll up your sleeves type of guy and get your hands dirty and and uh, you know even though he's perceived you know across America as this big time coach um, he's just he, he is really just an ordinary guy and and um, that's what that's really what you like about him so um, you know, we're off to a little rocky start, and, and I would have hoped maybe that we could have had a couple wins by now. But again, we knew it was not going to be easy this year, and, and those are the growing pains you go through. And, and uh, I don't like losing any more than anybody else. Uh, Fred, Coach Andrews, uh, was up till 4 in the morning getting this scouting report done. Coach P had a great scouting report on, on Michigan State, I mean, to the T. Uh, my coaches. Joe Pachota and Fred Andrews are just doing a tremendous job behind the scenes. Jim Bragoon, our director of basketball operations, Dan Fox, our trainer. These guys just, they do a tremendous job of getting people where they're supposed to go and, and uh, makes, makes everybody else's job a lot easier. So, uh, and people like you, Mike, that come up and, and you know, help us out in our program. It's just great. So, we got to hang together and uh, we really got to, you know, we've we got to continue. And, uh, you know, if you don't know the struggle, you don't know the strength. Uh, you know, we need, to, we need to just keep working on that. And, and the other one, and, and not to get too uh, quotish, so to speak, but, you know, tough times don't last, but tough people do, and we just got to tough it out. Very good. I agree with you 100%. We're going to take a break, and uh, when we come back, we're going to hopefully talk with a couple of the players on our PFW squad to, to see how they felt playing in the Copa Copa Classic. But that's when Mastodon Spotlight returns in just a moment. This is me, and my mom and dad, and my big brother Alex, and Jack. This is the day I learned that sandals got their name from sand, and that the ocean is bigger than all of us. This is the day we all got to forget I was sick. This was my wish. According to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, it kills over 1,500 people every year and injures 71,000 more. Inadequate sleep has been linked to health and safety risks, even premature death. But today, new treatments are helping millions get the sleep they need. So talk to your doctor or take our free risk assessment on the web at sleepfoundation.org. Sleep deprivation. It's real, it's dangerous, and it's more treatable than ever. chance now in a crowded locker room, after the training room here on the Breslin Center on the campus of Michigan State to talk to a couple of the senior members of the IPFW men's basketball team and Nick Wise and Matt Shepard. And guys, I know it's tough to talk, especially after a loss, but uh, what we'd like to do is to get your thoughts on playing here at Michigan State, uh, as Coach Noel said, one of the meccas of uh, college basketball. As the Spartans have made the Final Four the last three years running. And, Nick, we'll start with you. You had a little taste of D1 experience at Ball State. Um, what's these last two nights been like? Uh, like you said, it's definitely the mecca of college basketball the last couple years. Um, it's been a heck of an experience. Um, we came out here with two, with two losses, but uh, you know, it, tonight was kind of a letdown after, after last night. Uh, we played our butts off last night. And 
really focused and uh, you know, it's still just a heck of an experience and I'm really glad I got to go through it. Matt, you're a senior from not too far from here in New Waco, Michigan. Uh, what was it like for you being on the Breslin Slayer floor? Well, you know, growing up in Michigan, it's always Michigan State basketball is really big time. I mean, as it is in, I mean, Indiana, it's, you know, IU. But um, it was a great experience, you know, and I, I'm thankful I had an opportunity to do it. But, you know, it been nice to come out with some wins, uh, especially to Nick, well, tonight. But, um, you know, I think we, we made a statement yesterday. Um, with what we did against Michigan State, you know, you don't like to lose, and nobody likes to take a moral victory, and, and I, I don't, I don't get into that either. But what, <clears throat> what we can take from that is, you know, hey, look, you know, we can lace them up with the best of them, and uh, I think, um, you know, most guys are proud um, to be associated with IPFW basketball, and I think people, you know, are around sports not have an idea who we are. So that's been, that's been good. Have either of you played in front of fourteen thousand fans <laughs> before, like you did last night against the Spartans? No, I played in front of a lot of people at the. Uh, Indiana High School semi-state, but uh, not 14,000. Uh, it was pretty awesome. Yeah, I don't know about 14,000. We used to get some good crowds for you know high school tournaments and stuff like that, but I don't think it was 14. But you know, it was great. Okay. You played six games so far this year, and you know if people look at the box scores, they say IPFW 0-6. Oh, they must not be a good team. But mm -hmm. truthfully, you guys as a team, you're starting to come together. Uh, nobody's given you a chance to do anything this year, this first year playing a D1 schedule. Is that uh, kind of a rallying cry for you guys in the ball club? Yeah, I think so. Uh, we've had some very close games and uh, just a couple plays here and there in the second half. And, uh, you know, if we make the plays, and we could be 3-3 three and three or 4-2. and two. I mean, who knows? So, uh, yeah. you know, hopefully the experience of, of losing these uh, some close games in the second half will help us, you know, in future games. Matt, you've bulked up a lot since we first saw you last year, and I know Coach Noah has commented uh, how uh, how nice a job you've done in the weight room, and it's showing on the floor. Tonight you had to go up against a seven-footer at the University of Maine. Uh, what was that battle like? Well, you know, not only was he seven-foot, but he had really, really long arms, so that was, a, that was another obstacle, you know. Their main thing was besides the point guard who had a pretty good night. They wanted to get it inside and see what they could do and force, force some matchup problems for us. But um, I kind of watched how Lamar, who was the team that played main last night, how they played him. And they pretty much had a, um, a guy in front playing pretty low, and then they had a good help side. And so that's what we tried to do. But, you know, you don't get, especially at least I haven't so far, uh, get a chance to play against too many seven-footers. And you realize, you know, when people are seven-footed, it, it does make a difference. I don't care, you know, how thin they are, how, how what they are. Long arms and they're seven-footed, it, it's going to help them out. So, but hey, you know, we, we battled, and so that's what it's all about. This week, the, the road show continues. Um, as this show is being aired, you will have already played University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and getting ready to take on your former team, Nick, the Ball State Cardinals, and then you're going to finish that up two days later with a home game against Indiana Tech. Talk about this upcoming week for the two of you, and Nick especially, and I know I'm sure some of the uh, newspaper reporters may talk to you about going back home, so to speak, to take on the Cardinals. Right. Uh, yeah, it doesn't get any easier. Uh, uh, play Michigan, up to Michigan, and uh, that's going to be a very tough game. Ball State's been playing really well lately. Um, you know, it's anytime you play any Division One school, I mean, it's, it's going to be a challenge, and especially when you're playing the Big Ten and Mac schools. Uh, you got to step, step your level of play up and, and your concentration and focus. And, you know, I'm sure we'll do that. We'll have a couple of good days of practice, and uh, we'll be ready to get back after it. Your thoughts, man? <clears throat> well, kind of just with, with what Nick said, I mean, any time you play a Division One school, it doesn't matter who they are. I mean, there's 300 and some odd teams, and every one of them, you know, have, have, after they've been there a little while, and, we, you know, this is our first time around, uh, they realize that, what we're starting to know is that wins don't come easy, and it doesn't matter who you play or who you are. So um, with that in mind, we're going to go to Michigan, we're going to go to Ball State, and um, we're just going to come out there because, you know, we're 0-6 now, and we don't have anything to lose. All we have is to gain. So we're going to come out there, it's going to be a new game, and we're going to take it from there, and we're just going to realize that at one point, these close games are going to have to come out, you know, to some wins, and the mistakes that we're making, we're going to have to cut those down, or otherwise it's, you know, it's going to keep going. But I think... You know, when we do realize that and we, we can put it together and everybody has a pretty good game, you know, we, we can we prove that we can play with people. But now it's time, you know, to step that up, like Nick said, and, and just give it everything we have because, you know, it's all for the take. I will let you guys go. I know it's been a tough last uh, 30 hours or so, but 
we appreciate you giving us a few minutes of time here to talk about this experience playing at Michigan State. And we wish you well next week, this upcoming week, against Michigan, Ball State, and Indiana Tech. And, uh, and good luck the rest of the way. We hope to talk to you later in the season. Thank you. Thanks. Matt Shepard, Nick Wise, senior members of the IBFW basketball team, will take a break and bring Coach Doug Noll back and get his thoughts on the upcoming week. That's when Macedon Spotlight returns in just a moment. Dr. Hermine Van Nuys is a professor who teaches her English literature classes with passion to inspire her students. I'm very passionate about what I teach. I love the literature I teach. And I'm very proud of the faculty in my department. Her 30 years of dedication to IPFW has earned her much respect on the collegiate level. We offer, really, a wonderful English major, I think, with a number of opportunities. There really is much more, I think, probably a personal uh, relationship established in our classes because they tend to be smaller. Because of her experience, Dr. Van Nuys recognizes IPFW's advantages over other universities. Students here can come to our offices. They will be seen by us. We speak to them, which is the ideal way, I think, to teach. IPFW, the right school, right here, right now. Hi, I'm Amanda Tappan. On Stargate SG-1, my character discovered that the Stargate could be used as a key to unlock an endless variety of adventures. Your key for endless adventure is a good education. Don't limit your options. Stay in school. Welcome back to Mastodon Spotlight. We're once again talking with Doug Noll, head men's basketball coach at the university. And Doug, this weekend is over, but another tough week ahead for you. Um, as this show was aired, you have already played the University of Michigan on Tuesday night up in Ann Arbor, and that's followed by a matchup Thursday at Ball State, and uh, then you get to come home, believe it or not, and uh, on uh, Sunday you'll be playing Indiana Tech. Uh, though it's in a way future past, talk about these three games this week, beginning with the Michigan game in Ann Arbor. Well, again, it's, uh, I think, just a great opportunity for uh, our kids to experience Big Ten basketball and going into Ann Arbor. I mean, Matt Shepard is from Michigan, uh, and Brad grew up here in Michigan, you know, just down the road 30 miles. So, you know, growing up, you look at the Breslin, the Chrysler Arena, and you see two huge uh, arenas, and now you're able to play in them. And, and I think, you know, I, I've always told Matt that down the road, uh, you, know, you sit back and tell your kids, you know, Dad played in those, and, and that's, that's what it is. I mean, it's all part of that. And, and uh, Michigan, is, although they're down uh, a, a little bit, you know, uh, according to Michigan basketball, uh, they're going to they're gonna be really strong, and they gave Boston College a great game on Saturday. And so our, our, uh, our hopes are that, uh, you know, in a few days after they play us, they play Duke, so maybe they're looking ahead a little bit. And, uh, but we got to come and make a big effort and, and play a lot better than we did today. But bring that effort uh, that we played uh, on Friday against Michigan State to the University of Michigan. You don't get much rest after that. You go to Muncie, you're going to take on Ball State, and all they did in Hawaii was knock off then number three Kansas, then number four UCLA, and actually had a first half nine point lead on number one Duke before they lost. They're out the gate quick, three and one, and they're now nationally ranked. Well, yeah, and in some cases they could be the best team out of the, you know, the, the three that uh, we play in Michigan State and Michigan. Uh, they're just very athletic, quick, and uh, Tim Buckley's got a great great group of kids this year that we play, play well together and their chemistry is what's what is really so good and that's not going to be an easy task either but we're just going down the day of the game that was a game that was supposedly supposed to be in January because of their TV schedule we had to slide it in I'm, I wasn't real happy with that because I it, it's our last week of school before finals and it's really taxing for the kids uh, and then Indiana Tech and Jason Klein was very happy to move the game to uh, Sunday and give us one more day's rest because we have to take a day off this week. And uh, so I was just uh, hoping that, you know, uh, we wouldn't have had to schedule Ball State on, on Thursday. We could wait until January, but that wasn't the case. And so we'll do it. Uh, we'll put it on our schedule. We'll go down to Muncie on Thursday and play them and then thankfully come back and hopefully wear the white uniforms for a change at, uh, at the Gates Sports Center and uh, when we play Indiana Tech at 3 o'clock on Sunday. Two questions left, because I know you want to get back on the bus and head for home. 
injury status, uh, especially with uh, the two big men, Jim Kessenick and Zach Ruger? Well, uh, you saw we dressed Zach this weekend just to give him a feel of what the big time was like, and, and I think that was, uh, you know, uh, a good situation for Zach. He's a few weeks away yet. Uh, Jim goes back to the doctor December 5th. Uh, I think by December 20th, which is when we start our five-game road sweep, uh, swing uh, at Colorado State, Montana State, then we'll come back home for about two and a half days uh, in Christmas, and then we'll go back out to Oregon, Long Beach, and San Diego State. I hope they'll be ready at that point in time. We'll also get Terry Collins back uh, from Fort Wayne Snyder, point guard, who will be eligible December 20th. So that's going to help our depth tremendously. I mean, to get a 6'8 and 6'10 kids that can play the post, bring another point guard into the mix. Uh, we're really looking forward to that because uh, we're real thin right now. And in a year that you needed to be perfect, we've had some glitches with, with injuries, and it, it's just really, uh, really killing us. Everybody else okay health-wise? Uh, pretty much. Uh, Keon's got trouble with his uh, feet right now, um, and we're trying to work through that with some arch sports. Lee Bat's dinged up a little bit with his ankle, uh, but the rest of the guys are just uh, bumps and bruises. That's it. So, Final question. The morale of this ball club, even though they're 0 and 6 as we take this interview, uh, how is the morale? Well, I think, you know, uh, after today's game, we were a little down. Uh, and, and I got a little upset at halftime and, uh, you know, ran and raved a little bit. But I was just trying to get, uh, you know, all the all the juice out of them I could get today. And we really had to squeeze it hard. But uh, in the end, I think they gave us what they had left, as I mentioned earlier. And, uh, you know, you don't come in here and play at Michigan State. You expect to come back and, and feel just 100%. But, you know, if you only played basketball when you felt great, you'd only play it about you know, 20% of the time anyways. You're, you're, you're either dinged up, you're sore, you're hurting, you don't feel good or whatever, but you gotta go out there and tough it out. And hopefully our kids are learning that, Mike. Uh, we'll let you get out of here and go home and hopefully Thanks. the team gets some rest and uh, we'll talk to you again next week and All talk right. about these upcoming games. You got it. Doug Knoll, head men's basketball coach, has been our guest. That's it for this edition of Mastodon Spotlight. I want to thank all the coaches, all the players uh, from both the men's and women's teams for uh, appearing this week. And we invite you to come back next week when we'll talk some more IPFW basketball. But until then, this is Mike Moss saying have a great week and go Dons.